1959, while the world was captivated by the space race and the promise of atomic energy, a team of engineers in Wisconsin quietly changed history. They built the world's first fuel cell vehicle. It wasn't a car, it wasn't a spacecraft, it was an orange farm tractor. This is the story of how Alice Chalmers, a company better known for steam engines and heavy industrial machinery, created a piece of technology so advanced that it helped put men on the moon and inspired engineers for decades to come. But first, let's dive into the firm's background to really understand this genius concept. The company traces its roots back to 1847, when a small machine shop opened in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. In 1861, Edward P. Alice purchased a struggling firm called the Reliance Works at a sheriff's auction. Under his leadership, the company grew into one of the largest steam engine manufacturers in the world by 1900. In May 1901, the Edward P. Alice Company merged with three other industrial powerhouses, Fraser & Chalmers from Chicago, Gates Ironworks, and the Dixon Manufacturing Company. Together, they formed the Alice Chalmers Company. When they needed more space, they built a massive factory complex southwest of Milwaukee. The community that grew up around this plant eventually named itself West Alice. By the 1950s, Alice Chalmers had become an industrial giant. Their orange tractors were recognized on farms across America. Their machinery powered factories, mills and mines around the world. The company employed over 20,000 workers at their West Alice complex and had established themselves as the fourth largest manufacturer of farm equipment in the United States. But Alice Chalmers was never content with simply making tractors and heavy equipment. They were always looking ahead, investing in research and development that pushed the boundaries of what was possible. The concept of a fuel cell was not new in 1959. In fact, it dated back more than a century. In 1839, a Welsh scientist and lawyer named Sir William Robert Grove developed what he called a gas voltaic battery. He discovered that by combining hydrogen and oxygen through platinum electrodes, he could produce electricity and water. Grove had essentially proven that the process of electrolysis could be reversed. The idea was revolutionary, but for more than a hundred years, fuel cells remained little more than a scientific curiosity. They were too expensive, too complicated, and too impractical for any real-world application. That began to change in 1932 when an English engineer named Francis Thomas Bacon started working on practical fuel cell designs at Cambridge University. Bacon spent decades refining his alkaline fuel cell, replacing expensive platinum catalysts with more affordable nickel electrodes. By 1959, he had developed a working 6 kilowatt unit that could actually power equipment. The launch of Sputnik in 1957 changed everything. Suddenly, America was in a space race, and that race demanded entirely new sources of power. Batteries were too heavy and didn't last long enough. Solar panels of the era were inefficient, but fuel cells offered something remarkable. They produced electricity through a chemical reaction with no moving parts, no noise, and no pollution. And as a bonus, the only byproduct was pure water that astronauts could drink. Alice Chalmers had been quietly researching fuel cells since 1951, years before the space race began. Their research division in West Alice had assembled a team of scientists and engineers dedicated to developing electrical power through chemical reactions. Leading this effort was Harry Carl Ehrig, the vice president in charge of research at Alice Chalmers. Ehrig had joined the company in 1950 and immediately saw the potential of fuel cell technology. Working under him was physical chemist Jean Patrick Manuel, who served as research group leader and would play a crucial role in what came next. By August 1958, the team had developed fuel cells capable of lighting two 15-watt bulbs. It was a modest achievement, but it proved their concepts were sound. By March 1959, they were ready for something far more ambitious. Harry Ehrig had an idea. Instead of demonstrating their fuel cells in a laboratory setting, why not put them in something that farmers and the general public could understand? Why not a tractor? The team selected a chassis from the Alice Chalmers D12, a popular row crop tractor that had just entered production in 1959. 
but what they built on that chassis bore little resemblance to any farm machine anyone had ever seen. The fuel cell tractor was a strange-looking beast. Three large panels covered the massive fuel cell unit where an engine would normally sit. The operator sat dwarfed behind this bulky, box-like apparatus. The dashboard was packed with gauges and meters to monitor the chemical processes and electrical currents. Instead of a throttle, there were levers to control current and polarity. The system was incredibly complex. It contained 1,008 individual fuel cells, joined together in 112 units of nine cells each. These units were arranged in four horizontal banks. Oxygen tanks were mounted beneath the tractor and a propane tank sat behind the driver's seat. The propane served as a hydrogen-rich fuel source that reacted with oxygen through the fuel cells to produce electricity. The chemical reaction used potassium hydroxide as an electrolyte. When the propane and oxygen passed over the electrodes, they produced an electrical current that powered a standard Alice Chalmers 20-horsepower DC motor. The total electrical output was 15 kilowatts. The finished tractor weighed 5,270 pounds and could produce up to 3,000 pounds of drawbar pull, enough to handle a double-bottom plow. On October 15, 1959, engineers from the AC Research Division unveiled their creation. The location was the company-owned golf course just outside West Alice. The task was simple but symbolic. Plow a field of alfalfa. What happened that day was remarkable. This strange-looking tractor, powered by nothing but chemical reactions, successfully pulled a double-bottom plow through the Wisconsin soil. It worked without heat, without smoke, and without noise. That last point bears emphasis. The fuel cell tractor was essentially silent. Unlike the roaring diesel engines that dominated American farms, this machine operated in near-complete quiet. Contemporary observers noted that the only sound was the gentle whir of the electric motor and the soft crunch of soil turning under the plow. Alice Chalmers proudly announced that their tractor was twice as efficient as conventional tractors of the period. The power came from no moving parts in the fuel cell itself. It produced no harmful emissions. The only byproducts were water vapor and carbon dioxide. What Alice Chalmers achieved that October day was historically significant. This was the world's first vehicle of any kind to be powered by a fuel cell. Seven years would pass before General Motors unveiled their Electrovan in 1966, which is often incorrectly credited as the first fuel cell vehicle. The GM Electrovan was certainly more refined. It used liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen stored at cryogenic temperatures and was built on a modified GMC Handivan chassis. But Alice Chalmers got there first, using technology that was arguably more practical for the time since propane was readily available to farmers, while liquid hydrogen was not. Following the public demonstration, Alice Chalmers took their fuel cell tractor on tour. It appeared at state fairs across the United States, drawing crowds of curious farmers and engineering enthusiasts who marveled at this glimpse of the future. Despite the successful demonstration, the fuel cell tractor never went into production. The reason was simple, cost. The fuel cells were extraordinarily expensive to manufacture. The platinum and other precious metals required for the electrodes alone would have priced the tractor beyond the reach of any farmer. There were also practical concerns. The tractor required pure oxygen from pressurized tanks rather than pulling oxygen from the atmosphere like modern fuel cells can. Farmers would have had no practical way to obtain or store the oxygen supplies needed to keep the machine running. The infrastructure simply did not exist. But Alice Chalmers never intended the tractor to be a commercial product. It was a technology demonstrator, proof that fuel cells could power real work in the real world. And in that mission, it succeeded beyond anyone's expectations. The fuel cell tractor opened doors that led far beyond agriculture. Alice Chalmers continued developing fuel cell technology throughout the early 1960s. With assistance from the US Air Force and contracts from NASA, they built fuel cell-powered forklifts, golf carts, and even a one-man submarine. In 1965, Alice Chalmers built hydrogen-fueled fuel cell golf carts, further refining the technology. 
the company became a serious contender for NASA contracts during the Apollo program. Although they ultimately lost the Apollo fuel cell contract to Pratt & Whitney, which had secured patent rights to Francis Bacon's design, the work done at West Alice contributed significantly to the advancement of fuel cell technology. NASA would go on to use alkaline fuel cells in both the Gemini and Apollo missions. These cells provided power for onboard systems and produced drinking water for astronauts, just as the Alice Chalmers engineers had demonstrated years earlier with their orange tractor in Wisconsin. In 1966, Alice Chalmers expanded their Greendale research facility to include additional fuel cell development. About 500 employees worked on both fuel cell and atomic energy programs. The US military ordered millions of dollars worth of fuel cell equipment for various projects. The story does not have a happy ending for Alice Chalmers. In December 1970, the company announced it would discontinue its fuel cell division due to the loss of major contracts. The technology they had pioneered was sold to Teledyne Corporation. The broader company would struggle through the following decades. Changes in agricultural and industrial markets, combined with increased competition, took their toll. Alice Chalmers filed for bankruptcy in 1987. The company that had once employed over 20,000 workers in West Alice finally closed its last Milwaukee office in January 1999, but the fuel cell tractor survived. After its demonstrations were completed, Alice Chalmers donated the machine to the Smithsonian Institution, recognizing its historical significance. Today, the tractor is on long-term loan to the McLeod County Historical Society in Hutchinson, Minnesota, where it is displayed near the site of the annual Orange Spectacular, the largest Alice Chalmers show in the world. Looking back from 2025, the Alice Chalmers fuel cell tractor seems almost prophetic. Today, every major farm equipment manufacturer is exploring electric and hydrogen-powered alternatives to diesel. In 2009, 50 years after Alice Chalmers' demonstration, New Holland unveiled their NH2 hydrogen fuel cell tractor prototype at the SIMA show in Paris. Based on the T6000 series, it generated 106 horsepower and produced nothing but water vapor as exhaust. The technology that seemed impossibly expensive in 1959 is slowly becoming practical. Hydrogen infrastructure is expanding. Fuel cell costs are declining. The vision of a clean, quiet farm powered by renewable energy, which Alice Chalmers demonstrated more than six decades ago, may finally be within reach. The Alice Chalmers fuel cell tractor stands as a testament to American engineering innovation. A company known for building heavy industrial machinery and orange farm tractors took on one of the most challenging technological problems of its era and succeeded. They did not build the tractor because it would make money. They built it because they believed in the technology and wanted to prove it could work. That proof would help shape the future of space exploration, military applications, and eventually the transportation industry itself. The next time you hear about hydrogen fuel cells as the future of clean transportation, Remember that future was first demonstrated in a Wisconsin alfalfa field in October 1959. A team of engineers from West Alice, working for a company that no longer exists, showed the world what was possible. That orange tractor, now sitting in a Minnesota museum, was 66 years ahead of its time, and the technology it pioneered is only now beginning to fulfill its promise.